Well, good morning. It's good to see those that are here this morning. We will uh, go ahead and get started with our call to worship. So if you'll please stand, we'll sing, I will sing the wondrous story. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How we left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal I was bruised, but Jesus healed me. Faint was I from many a fall. Sight was gone, and fears possessed me, but he freed me from them all. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Well, good morning, church family. It's great to see everybody here this morning. Uh, welcome to Hillcrest Baptist Church. We uh, do welcome our home folk and our visitors this morning. Uh, glad to see Brother Jerry and Miss Rhonda back with us this morning after a, a week of much uh, deserved and needed rest. Uh, and uh, just a few, just one announcement that I have. Uh, tomorrow uh, at three o'clock uh, will be the the uh, funeral for uh, Brother uh, Baggett, uh, who died last or passed away last week. Uh, so if, um, that will be the visitations at two o'clock at Mick Reynolds and Nave, right? And so uh, be remember, remember them in your prayers. Uh, other than that, we just want to welcome you here at Hillcrest Baptist Church this morning. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to sing and we're going to stand and we're going to wave from afar. so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this shot, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. And you may be seated as we continue on with He Lives. Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is 
living, whatever man may say, I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O oh Christ. Lift up your voice and sing Eternal Alleluia's to Jesus Christ the King The hope of all who seek Him The help of all who find None other is so loving So good and kind He lives, He lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. And if you would please stand as we continue on with Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. Forth to the mighty conflict, in this his glorious day. Ye who are men now serve him against unnumbered foes. Let's go. Rise with danger and strength to strength oppose. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel. Stand up, 
stand up for Jesus, the strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor song. To him who overcometh, a crown of life shall be. may be seated. Take me past the outer court Into the holy place Past the brazen altar Lord, I want to see your face Pass me by the crowds of people And the priests to sing your praise I hunger and thirst for your righteousness, but it's found in just one place. Take me into the holy of holies. Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Take me into the holy of holies. Take the coal, touch my lips, here I am. Bring me in the inner court and pass the golden light. Through the incense altar, Lord, I long to see your light. Let me touch the colored curtain, clothed in linen white. Part the veil that's hanging, that keeps you from man's sight. Take me into the holy of holies. Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Take me into the holy of holies. Take the coal. Touch my lips, here I am. Take me past the outer courts Into the holy place Past the brazen altar Lord, I long to see your face Pass me by the crowds of people and the priests who sing your praise. I hunger and thirst for your righteousness, 
but it's found in just one place. Take me into the Holy of Holies. Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Take me into the Holy of Holies. Take the coal, touch my lips, here I am. Take the coal, touch my lips, here I am. Take the coal, touch my lips, here I am. Didn't Wayne do a fantastic job? Yeah. We are going to uh, pray. We're going to pray for Henry Baggett's family. Dorothy and Henry had been married over 60 years. Uh, Henry was one of our charter members, which that means he helped establish our church. Uh, he was a deacon and a Sunday school teacher, and uh, he took care of his mother for many, many years. Just a good guy. Passed away at 90 years old and had a good long life, so we're going to pray for that family. So let's go to the Lord and pray. Almighty Father, Lord, we love you and praise you, and Father, you're our God, our Lord, our Savior, our Creator. We worship you today, Father. We come to meet you and feel the presence of God here today. As Wayne saying, Father, take that piece of coal and touch our tongues, Father, and ignite us for the kingdom of God. Help us, Father, to be able to share our testimonies and, and the blessings that you've poured out on each one of us. You've really blessed our church, Lord, and we thank you, God, for that. Uh, you've allowed us financial freedoms, and Father, uh, ministry opportunities, and Father, you've allowed us to add to the kingdom of God, and we just praise you and praise you for what you do at Hillcrest Baptist Church. I thank you, Lord, for each one here today, and you've brought visitors to us, and Father, decisions have been made for you, and Father, help us to be faithful to you, to be committed and surrendered to you. I pray, Lord, for the Baggett family. I lift them up to you, Lord, especially tomorrow around 3 o'clock, and that you would give them great comfort, Father, that you would take care of Dorothy. I pray, Lord, that you'd be with Brother Bobby as he gives the message. Lord, I pray your hand to be right on the whole family, Lord. Today, as we open up the Word of God, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts, Father, that we'd hear the Word of God spoken in such a way, Father, that uh, there's conviction needs to be taken place, Father, that would happen. If the encouragement needs to be taken place, Lord, that that would happen. I pray that all of us would hear and feel the presence of Jesus right now. And Father, as we hear that we would apply your Word to our lives. God, we love you. We pray that uh, you feel our love and our devotion. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> if you would, turn your Bibles to Psalm 132, and this will be the last of the ascent psalms that we've been studying. Psalm 132, it's all about God's presence with us forever. So we'll read 132, then I'll give you a few thoughts. Psalm 132 starts out, Lord, remember David and all his afflictions. 
And he swore to the Lord David and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go up to the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Behold, we heard it in Ephrathah, we found in the fields of the woods, let us go into his tabernacle. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priest be clothed with righteousness and let your saints shout for joy. For your servant David's sake, do not turn away the face of your anointed. The Lord has sworn in truth to David, he will not pour or turn from it. I will set upon your throne the fruit of your body. If your sons will keep my covenant and my testimony, which I shall teach them, their sons shall sit upon your throne for forever. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, and be upon himself his crown shall flourish. Again, the uh, title of this message is God's Presence with Us Forever. I read this introduction statement in one of my commentaries. I want to share it with you. It starts out, why are we here this morning? Some might answer that we're here to worship. And I hope all of us answer it like that. Others might answer that it's Sunday. We just come to church on Sundays. Some might say they are here by obligation. Mom made me come. Dad made me come. The question of why we are here might very well have been the question of the worshipers of this text written back then. Uh, this psalm draws them back to why they had journeyed to Jerusalem in the first place. Yes, they were carrying all the command of God with them, but more than that, they were seeking God and seeking the very presence of God in their lives. Psalm 132 is bringing us into the presence of God. It's showing us um, how to feel the presence of God, how to uh, allow him to speak to our hearts. All of us come in a, a different emotion. Something's going on in our life. Every one of us is different. You may come today to be encouraged. Some may come to be convicted by the word of God. I, I can tell you this. When I first started going back to, to church in my 30s, I had lived such a, a way of life that Every time I went to church, I felt the word convicting my heart. I really felt like that preacher had it in for me. I thought he preached to me every Sunday. I just felt like there was nobody else in that sanctuary. And there was 900 to 1,000 people there. And it seemed like he just zeroed in on my heart. And at that time, we had some grocery stores and we kept them open on Sundays. And I worked a lot of Sundays. And every single Sunday that I went, I heard the preacher say something about working on Sundays. And I went home, told Rhonda, I'm gonna quit going. All I hear is him telling me to quit working on Sundays and that's how we pay bills. But that wasn't the preacher speaking to me. That was God speaking to me. And he finally got hold of my heart and I, I just walked in one of my stores one Sunday morning and locked the door and closed it down. Lost a lot of money doing that, but you know, I never missed a penny of that. Uh, that's when God was calling me into the full-time ministry, and I didn't know that, but he was. But every time I came to church at that time, I felt the conviction. I, I wasn't really encouraged, but then once I got over the conviction part and started getting right with God, I started feeling the encouragement. The Word speaks to all of us a little bit different, but that's why we come to church. So you may be feeling that the preacher speaks to you every Sunday. Well, I don't ever prepare a sermon just Clarence I never have prepared a sermon just for you Gina I've never prepared a sermon just for you it's never for any one person and sometimes I know it feels like it in fact you tell me it does David I have prepared sermons just for you but <laughs> the Bible tells us that this presence that we're talking about will be forever 
That word forever means there's no end. So when we come in the presence of God, he allows us to come into his presence. He, he is here in this church, in this sanctuary. And the Bible gives us encouragement knowing that when you come in those doors and you sit in these pews, you're going to be in the presence of God, whether it be Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, on up throughout the week. He's here. He's also in your heart if you know him as Savior. Always. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's always your God. You're always in his presence. The people who were going up to, to worship God, uh, they may have been the first generation, as this was written, or they may have been generations past. And it's the same deal. The people were being drawn to the, the temple in Mount Zion to be in the presence of God. And during that traveling, the, the time it took them to wherever they left from to get there, there was a lot of things that took place in their lives. Some of it was good, some of it was bad. Some of them probably did without water and got thirsty on the way. Some probably got hungry on the way. And their focus got off God. But once they got there, God just drew them into the presence of God. But I'm telling you, not just that first generation when the temple was built, but it's going on today too. This applies to us. God is drawing us into his presence. When you come in Hillcrest Baptist Church, I guarantee you, you will feel the presence of God. It may be conviction, or it may be encouragement, or all in between. God speaks to us even today. Uh, Psalm 132, as it was written, was their promise. It was their encouragement. And it was their personal time to be in the presence of God. So as we apply this to our lives, it's our promise. It's our encouragement. It's our time to be in the presence of God. So right now, as I'm talking and I'm reading scripture, you can put everything aside and you can spend time with the Lord Jesus Christ right now. You can feel his presence. You can absorb him, be overwhelmed with him. He will speak to you if you'll allow him to. He's here and this is our encouragement, the Word of God. He's drawing us here for some reason, and He'll not let you go without letting you know what that reason is if you'll open up your heart to Him. They had a hunger for the Lord's presence. They would leave and travel for miles and miles and miles. Back then they walked, and sometimes there was weather involved in this. But they had a hunger to be in God's presence. So my question to you guys is this. Do you have a hunger to be in God's presence? And I know you do because you're here today. But think about all those times that you've had to deal with, oh, I don't think I want to go to church today. If you don't want to go to church just because, I want to say it, you may think the preacher's talking to you, just because you're being lazy, that's not a hunger to be in the presence of God. The hunger is you're going to be here no matter what. You want to be in the presence of God. You've got business to do with the presence of God. You want to feel his, whatever he's speaking to you about, you want to feel that in your heart. You want God to change you. You want God to grow you. You want God to mature you. You want to be able to work for God. You want to be able to share your testimony. You just get a hunger. Anybody ever get a hunger for something? Don, what do you get hunger for? I know one thing you get hunger for, he gets a hunger for hot dogs. Then he makes me get a hunger for hot dogs. And that thing kind of spreads around. Whoever talks with Don, oh, they get a hankering for a hot dog. And, and you don't get rid of that hankering until you take care of it. I know that's not a biblical term, hankering, but that's what happens. But I'm saying, I'm asking, do you get a hunger for God like that? Or even more so? That's what hunger is. You, you just want to taste him. You want to be in his presence. Well, certain things had to happen before they could get to this temple. Remember back in the old days with David, there wasn't a temple. There was an ark. There was a temple made out of tent. The, the ark of the covenant, the, the tent covering a portable tent so that they put the ark in that tent and they'd carry it around from place to place. David was making a vow to God to build him a temple, a permanent dwelling place. 
So some things had to happen before they could get to this temple. And I wrote down some of the things that had to happen before they could get to that temple in Mount Zion. First of all, a temple had to be built. There wasn't a temple before this. Supplies had to be gathered to build the temple. Hearts had to be made right to build this temple. Builders and workers had to be recruited. You're not going to build a temple without workers and builders. Gold, silver, bronze, timber, building material, stones, they had to be gathered. Those stones are massive. They had to be carved out of something pretty, out of something just a blob of stone. All this stuff had to happen before, before they could meet in a permanent temple. But there was something else that had to happen too. And David is telling us about this in his own life. There had to be a devotion to the Lord, a commitment to the Lord, a surrenderedness to the Lord. They had to uh, have a willing spirit to accomplish this task of building this temple. So let's, before we go any further, let's think about the application here. This sanctuary didn't used to be here. This church didn't used to be here. In the mid-60s, Henry Baggett was one of them. They got together as a group of men at another church, and they were going to what we call a church plant. They were going to plant this mission church. So things had to happen. People had to get right with God. There had to be devotion. There had to be commitment, surrenderedness. They had to have a willing spirit. All these people that, that joined with the group that built this had to have all that. And then they built the first part, what we call the fellowship hall. Then they built the sanctuary. Now, isn't this a gorgeous sanctuary? It's, it's a wonderful meeting place. But it didn't just happen. There was devotion involved and commitment and surrenderedness gathering of materials and workers and all that stuff. And think about what's taking place out there now. We're in a building process. And to accomplish God's will, his presence is going to be out of that family life center just like it is in this sanctuary. This is his house. This is his temple. This is his building. This is God's presence and we're building a family life center so that others can come. It will attract others to this church in a way that we don't have now. But there also has to be a devotion and a commitment and surrenderedness to build that because that is God's building. That's not our building. We've heard from God to do it, and we said, yes, we'll do it. We voted to do it, and it's going to happen. But if we don't do it in God's way, then it's going to fail. Well, let's keep on going and let's look at the first five verses and, because David makes a vow to God, a promise to God, and, and we'll see how that is applicable to our lives as well. So let's read verses 1 through 5 together again. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go up to the comfort of my bed, well, I, I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. As David is making this vow to God, the writer is asking God to remember the afflictions that David went through. And when David became king, he became king of a divided nation, Jerusalem and Judah. They often fought together. I mean, fought together and fought against each other. David was faced with affliction after affliction. There was famines he had to deal with, the sins that he had to deal with, even his own sins he dealt with. He had to have, he dealt with Absalom, his son, trying to take his kingship away from him. I mean, just one thing after another. Lord, remember David's afflictions because as David is going to make this vow, you're going to see through those afflictions he kept on fighting to do the Lord's will with a devotion in his heart and a commitment in his heart. So David went through this stuff to build God a temple, a permanent dwelling place. Not everyone back then worshipped the same God. So in this temple, if you're going to worship there, you were going to worship the same God. Not everyone 
had overcome their sins. When you came into the presence of God, uh, there was provisions to forgive you of your sins. Outside of the temple, not so. But when you get in the presence of God, that's what that conviction I was talking about. When God convicted me, I knew that I was sinning. I knew I was not doing what God had taught me to do. And, and through his word, I wasn't keeping the word at all. So there had to be some forgiveness of sin. And David had to deal with that. He had to deal with the sins of his family. He was surrounded by these afflictions. But then look at verse 2. He swore to the Lord. He vowed to the mighty one of Jacob. Now, give us a thought for a second. Do you know how serious a vow was to God? God took, took vows really serious. If you broke a vow with God, sometimes you lost your life. He'd take it away from you. That's how serious it was to God. Uh, there were other consequences. You might lose your family. You might lose your farm. God took these vows serious. And the, the Bible tells us in verse 2, he swore to the Lord. He made a vow to God. So what does that have to do with us? Well, making a vow to God and keeping it speaks to our character, our integrity. When you make a vow to God, you ought to keep it. When you give your life to Jesus, you're making a vow to God that you're going to be his child and serve him and do the things he's asked you to do. Think about all the Christians that have made vows to God. When they first get saved, I vow my life to you, Lord. I promise that I'll work for you. I'll serve you. I'll do the things that that preacher talks about or that Sunday school teacher talks about or my Christian friends talk about. And we get so excited about the Lord, we do those for about six months and what happens? Sometimes we break our vows, and then we wonder why our, our, uh, the consequences come. Making vows requires responsibilities, uh, uh, obligations to be kept, promises to be kept. And David's vow, when he made a vow to God, there was no exit clause. Did you understand what I just said? Now hear me. When I say this, when he made a vow to God, there was no exit clause. How many of us have broken vows to God? David swore to carry out God's vow. So what's the application to us? It ought to be this. If we make a vow to God, we ought to keep it. Do we agree with me? If we make a vow to God, we ought to keep it. This vow that David made was not self-centered. It was other-centered. When we make a vow to build a building like we have, it's not for us. It's for others. It's not self-centered. It's other-centered. It's for the work of God. It's to draw people into the kingdom of God. It's to reach out to others. Where we're not doing a very good job now, we'll have a gym where we can invite them to play ball with us. Uh, sometimes I look around and some of us that are going to be playing ball good night. We had a team of ball players out here. This, Harold, you ready to play basketball? Don, <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, mercy, I can see it now. I've got two replaced knees. Some have got replaced hips. It takes us five minutes to walk down from one. To... Anyways, we're going to use the Family Life Center to draw people in as well as keep our own people happy. Keep on going and look at um, where this vow stems from. Look at verses 3 through 5. And you're going to hear what David has on his heart. Surely, he says, I will not go into the chamber of my house. I'm not going to go into the bedroom of my house or go up to the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids. I'm not going to sleep, Lord, until I find a place for you, a dwelling place for the Lord Almighty. 
he's kind of feeling guilty. David's got a pretty nice house he's built for himself, made of cedar, it's pretty big. It's just really a great house, back then especially a great house. And he can't understand in his own heart how he could have such a fine house and God's being met in a tent. So he's making a vow to God to build God a permanent something now. He's devoted his life to building this temple. So here's a thought to ponder on, or several thoughts in preparing to make vows to God and after we make vows to God. Uh, I wrote down some things I want to share with them. This is from a pastor that loves you. Too many believers are unwilling to sacrifice for the Lord. We're all in that same boat together. We're just unwilling sometimes to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Some believers do not tithe or give offerings. In fact, a lot of people don't tithe. That's 10% of your, your gross income, not your net, but your gross. I'm going to say this, and you're just going to have to hear it. Some of you got a stimulus check in the mail last year, and you got one this year. I wonder how many Christians gave 10% of that stimulus check back to the Lord. That's a gift from God. We ought to be tithing on that. But a lot of Christians don't. I'm talking about David making a vow with devotion and commitment and surrenderedness, and then we apply the Word of God to our lives. Are we tithing? Are we giving like we ought to be giving? Many are unwilling to give their time. How many of us are willing to give up the time needed to serve God? Many of us are not willing to give our talents. Sometimes, you know, when we have choir practice and we encourage people to come sing with us, how many times do you think I hear, I can't sing, preacher? All of us have a voice. We don't ask you to sing pretty. I was going to say purdy, but we just ask you to, to use the voice that God has given you. You can't hear us half the time anyway, so what does it matter? How many of us are willing to use our talents? Some of you, he's given talents, and we see such a great work out of those talents, yet when it comes to church, we don't see it. Some of us are not willing to offer our lives to the Lord Jesus. Lord, I surrender me. When I surrendered to preach, I had zero to offer God. Zero. I'd been in business all my life. I majored in business. I wanted to make all the money in the world. I worked for all the money in the world. I put aside a family to work and make as much as we could. And the more I made, the more I needed. I didn't know the Word of God. I didn't know the books of the Bible. I could not tell you the difference between John and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. I didn't know any of that stuff. Yet God knew something was in me. And, and when he called me, I gave him my life. And here's what I said to him. Lord, I don't know the books of the Bible. How can I preach if I don't know the books of the Bible? I'd been out of school, out of regular college for uh, 14 years, I think. And I knew I needed to have to go to seminary to learn the books of the Bible, if nothing else, to find out what this thing actually meant, because I never used to read it. So I went to sem I had to apply to seminary, and at 35 years old, you had to pass an English test. Where to put a comma, a semicolon? I hardly knew what a semicolon was at that time. When I got out of regular college in 1976, I vowed to Rhonda, my wife, that I would never read another book, ever. And I had not read another book till I got to seminary. So when it came to that English thing, I told Lord, this is the test. If I can pass that English test and they accept me, I'll go to seminary. Well, guess what? I passed the English test and I got accepted. And at that moment, I surrendered my life to the Lord. How many of us are, and God doesn't call all of us to preach. I know that. But how many of us does God call to surrender our lives? And when you get saved, all of us. There's a cost of being totally committed to God. He owns everything. 
everything about you. And you're going to have to give up certain things to serve him. Look at verse 5 again. David said, until I find a place for the Lord, I am not going to sleep. I'm not going to rest until I accomplish this purpose of building a temple for the Lord. And David, he committed right then to God. And think about our family life center, our new building. Same process. We got to come up with materials. We got to come up with builders and workers and monies to pay for it. And after we get it finished, we got to have people to help us man it, to commit to it. It's going to require a lot of work. It's going to cost. And if we don't do it the way the Lord asks us to, then it's not going to work. So that's the application so far is we surrender to God. We give our lives to God. David did it. He built the well, he didn't get to build the temple. He gathered all that material, and Solomon, his son, built this temple. It happened because of the commitment, the surrenderedness, the willingness, the desire to serve God. So what would be the application for us? We need that devotion, that commitment, that, that uh, surrenderedness, that desire. David was willing to sacrifice and endure hardships for the Lord. And he encouraged the other people and they followed just like David. They surrendered their lives. They did what they had to do. Can you imagine taking a stone as big as this, this pulpit right here and carving something about like that, just intricate, beautiful stone carving out of something like this? And they didn't have the pneumatic tools that we have now. And they took a chisel and a hammer and worked away at it. And they did it. I'll keep going and look at uh, how when we worship God, it, it requires a sacrifice, and that worship will lead to righteousness and joy. Look at verse 7 and verse 9. Let us go to his tabernacle. We're in his tabernacle right now. Let us worship at his footstool. I hope that you're worshiping God right this very moment. Verse 9. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness and your saints shout for joy. As we sacrifice to worship God, that worship leads us to righteousness and joy. So as we get in the presence of God, you may come in here and your joy is about that, that much. And when you leave, your joy is about that much. When you really worship God, when you get in the presence of God, you can't help it. When you're in the presence of God, he just overwhelms you. You want to worship him. You want to become more righteous. You want to mature in your Christian walk. But you also want to fill up with his joy. And that joy sometimes helps us overcome the junk in this life. Pretty hard nowadays to, to uh, not get discouraged. There's a lot of junk going on in this world, in our country. Uh, it's probably going to be like this for another year or two or three or ten. Who knows? It may be over. But our joy doesn't have to be depleted Amen. to go into the future. We come here and we worship God and we leave here and our joy's up and it got to get back into the world Monday and Tuesday. But we have the privilege of coming Wednesday and re, refilling the joy and then go Thursday, Friday, and Saturday and down again, get back up Sunday. Or you can have the presence of God and worship it every single day and that joy's there. Thank you, Lord. we we'll become a dynasty of descendants that worship God if we keep his words. Um, God then decides some things for David in God's people. Look at verses 13 through 16. God decided he has chosen Zion. Not David, but God. God has desired it for his dwelling place. He picked out the spot and he desired that spot and he's still there in that spot, but he's also here in this spot. Verse 14, this is my resting place forever. 
Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provisions. This is God speaking to us. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud with joy or for joy. Part of this promise, he says it's forever, but part of this promise has yet to be filled. This is still an earthly temple. This temple could crumble any time. We could have an earthquake and this temple be gone. We'd have to rebuild. Uh, somebody could drop a bomb on this thing and just blow it all to pieces. This is a still a temporary, even though it's made of blocks and brick, it's still temporary. It's not going to last forever. But he's got something in store for us that is going to last forever. It's going to replace this temporary temple. So I want to kind of wind this down with some encouraging words to those that believe Jesus, that he's your Savior. And it's in Revelation chapter 21. I'm going to read to you several verses. And I want you to listen to these verses. I want you to hear them, what you have waiting for you. And, and this is temporary, but this is going to be new and forever, for eternity, no end. So let me read to you out of Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5. And this is John writing what he saw from God. He writes, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Now what's that say right there? Something's going to happen to this earth. Something's going to happen to the heaven out there. It's going to be gone. There's going to be a new one. And the first earth passed away. It's gone. God will destroy it and start out with this new earth, this new heaven. And there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. What a verse. This new heaven, and as it comes down on this new earth, God's going to be right here with us. And then verse 5. Well, verse 4, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Amen. Think about what's taking place in Washington right now. Think about the COVID, uh, the coronavirus that we're going through right now. Think about all the hardships this country is going through. Those that are struggling, even paying their bills, can't pay their rent. None of that's going to be on this new earth and new heaven. It's going to be no more tears, no more sorrows, no more COVIDs, no more protest. <laughs> Perfect. That's what's waiting for us. As we worship in his presence here, one day it's going to be in his presence physically. And we're going to be his people. We're his people now, but sometimes he feels afar off, doesn't he? When we get in trouble and hurt or something, something goes on. But up there, there's not going to be any of that junk, not the stuff we face every day. In verse 5, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. I don't know about you, but boy, that's going to be nice. All things, not just some things, all things are going to be made new. And he said to me, write these words for they're true and faithful. So let those sink in. And let me read to you some more verses out of chapter 21, verses 22 through 27. And John writes, I saw no, I saw no temple in it. There's no temple, there's no building in this new heaven this new uh, holy city. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple, Jesus Christ. We're going to see him face to face. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut all by the day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. 
but there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. The only, uh, only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. You see how important it is to be saved. When you get saved, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I tell the children, God uses a permanent magic marker. It cannot be erased. And these verses are written for us. This is what we have waiting for us. These are not my words. They are God's words. These are, this is the promise fulfilled. David built a temple. We built a temple or a church. But these are temporary. It's not quite finished yet. One day, God will finish with a new creation, a new church, a new building, a new holy city. Not a building, but a new holy city. I don't know about you, but I can't hardly wait. I'm so tired of the junk we're going through. Every time I get a phone call, I'm wondering who else is sick. What's going on? Who needs help? We're going to continue plugging away. We're going to take care of the needs as we can. But boy, the hope and the encouragement is what we're reading right now. Look at chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its streets on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 tr fruits each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations and there shall be no more curse but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it and the servants shall serve him. And look at verse 4. And they shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. Can you imagine seeing Jesus and his name written right there on your forehead? Just carved right there. I don't know how that's going to take place, but I just know it is because that's what I just read. Verse 5, there will be no more night. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And then I'm looking around, and we're going to be together facing Jesus forever and ever together. Yes, sir. Three verses in 22 that I want to close with. And they're huge. Um, there's a, a commandment. There's a, something that God wants us to hear straight from him. 22 verse 7. This is Jesus speaking. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. What did he just say? I'm coming quickly. Be prepared. Keep the word. Verse 12, And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Behold, I'm coming quickly twice so far. If God says it twice, it's pretty important, but if he says it three times, it's triply important. Look at verse 20. Surely I am coming quickly. Man, God means business. He wants us to hear. He wants his people to hear that he's coming. He could come this very second. Maybe on down the road, but be prepared. And a reward is waiting. He's going to bring a reward, and you'll be given a reward according to your work. Some are gifted to do certain works. Others are gifted to do the other works. It doesn't matter that the reward is the presence of Jesus. That's enough. The question is, are we ready? Are we doing what God has commanded us to do? Are we prepared? Are we building? Are we committed? Are we surrendered to him? Do we have a willingness in our heart to serve him, to give our life to him, no matter what he asks us to do? When Wayne sang that song, it had to do with Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah was saying, Lord, here I am, send me. Are we willing to do like Isaiah? Put that coal on my tongue so I just burn for the, the work of God. So today, you may have been convicted. You may be encouraged. I hope that you were encouraged. There's things that all of us need to be convicted about. Uh, but there's many things that we need to be encouraged about. 
the greatest is this new heaven and new earth. It's coming. It's no holy city where there's nothing in it that will defile it. No sin. No crummies, COVID or marches on Washington or people getting shot like they are now. It's going to be good stuff. you got to be in the Lamb's Book of Life if you're going to be part of it. And that means you got to be saved. You've got to invite Jesus into your heart, into your life. That's so easy to do. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I know that you died for me. I know that you were resurrected, and I believe all that stuff. I want you in my life. Pretty simple. You do that, say that to Jesus, and he's going to put your name in his book. I'm going to be up front. I'm going to offer an invitation in just a second. If you've never invited Jesus into your heart, come on down, and I'll pray with you. If you just need to give your life to the Lord in commitment, you can do that in your pew. You can come down here at the altar and get on your knees and do it, or you can come up here and I'll pray with you about it. This is God's time. So let's stand, and whatever God puts on your heart, know this. I'll be up front. I sure would love to pray with you. And uh, If you never invited Jesus into your heart, please don't go home without that. So we're going to sing and see what God does. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God. I come, I come, just as I am, and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood can each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a dark Fighting within and fierce without a lamb of God, I come, I come. You just pray. If there needs to be a decision, then uh, we'll sing one more time. And poor, wretched, blind, sight reaches healing of the mind. Yea, all I need in me to find. Almighty Father, how we love you and praise you. And I pray, Lord, for each one as they leave. I pray, Lord, that you give them traveling mercies on the way home. I pray that you bless them with your presence, Father, in their homes. And Lord, today would just be a day with the Lord. What a privilege it is to be a child of God. We sure love you and praise you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.